first, first of all, I want to say I do appreciate the work you're doing and the difficult decisions that you have to make. Your committee is about to embark on the largest publicly funded infrastructure project in the history of Greater Victoria and probably the most controversial. If this project cannot be absolutely justified based on the best available science, then it must be halted and a science-based analysis needs to be done. Spending almost a billion dollars, that's nine zeros, on the current plan is, with respect, reckless. The original plan, the distributed treatment plans, was estimated to cost more than 1.2 million. And due to concerns over high costs, the current plan evolved. Now the so-called cheaper plan involves placing the treatment plant on a small piece of property at the entrance to Victoria's beautiful inner harbor. And I can almost see where it's going to be from where I'm standing. This, there has to be a better way. There has to be a better plan. There won't be an opportunity for a do-over once the money is spent. Now, my understanding, I've just spent a lot of time in the Wastewater Made Clear website, is that the current estimates for capital costs are almost $783 million. And that the projected length of time that that plant will be able to meet the, the capacity of us to produce the effluent that will go through it will be exceeded by 2030, providing the plan is commissioned by 2018. So that's a 12-year timeline. When we add the estimated operating costs of $14.5 million a year uh, times 12 years, that, it, that comes to $174 million. Add that to the capital costs, that's $957 million before any cost overruns. Based on current plans, they say 2030, given the current growth rates, in particular in the West Shore communities, it may become necessary to expand the system. Therefore, taxpayers are going to be asked, or water users are going to be asked to kick in again. Now, yes, I realize the federal and provincial governments have verbally committed to pay a portion of this, and they've both been very careful to cap the amount they're going to give you, meaning there won't be any more coming. And the province has also very nicely said that they won't give us any until the system is in and operating. Now, that leaves local area residents with a $281 million bill before operating costs are considered and before cost overruns. And I knew, learned a new term surfing the internet looking for information for this. Cost overruns known in the industry as scope creep, nice way to put it, will be paid by area residents alone through their municipalities to the CRD as the system operator. If this system doesn't achieve real environmental benefits, it's highly unlikely that any additional funds will be forthcoming from the senior levels of government. They'll say, we gave it to you, you have what you're gonna get. So I would ask you as directors, how will the CRD deal with cost overruns? What portions of the plan would be cut to contain costs? What can the CRD do about possible increases to borrowing costs if interest rates begin to rise? And we're in a world economy nowadays. We have no control, not even as a country. The international marketplace sets uh, interest rate. How will inflationary price increases be dealt with over the next six years if the world economy starts to pick up and, and construction companies begin to get busy, prices will rise. Does every member of the committee and the board have full confidence in the current estimates? And are they absolutely confident that once completed, the system will meet or exceed expectations? And do we know what those expectations are? Have they been articulated? Now, previous speakers spoke to the issue of cost overruns, and there are many examples in British Columbia's history. I'll bring up one more and then two other points to do with that. And I'm talking now. Okay. Uh, the Coquihalla Highway, which ran 240% over. Now, there's one thing about when provincial projects run over, is everybody in BC that pays taxes or fees gets to contribute to those cost overruns. In this case, the residents of seven municipalities are going to pick up all of those cost overruns. My point would be, well, I want to just quickly say, on a 10% cost overrun, an 800 or 782 million would be 78 million. 20%, 156 million. 30%, 234 million dollars on those residents of those seven municipalities. So I would say, before politicians embark on this seriously expensive project, we, the citizens, must know 
that the resulting system will have a significant and measurable environmental benefit. And remember, thank you very much, and I urge you to support uh, Director Dermott's motion. Thank you. Madam Chair, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I bought and prepared the presentation, which I do will scrap. You've heard it all. Uh, I'd just like to offer one or two little thoughts. Evidence-based policy, evidence-based decision-making, it's essential. That's been mentioned before. The alternative, once you start down the slippery slope of belief and optics and prejudice, uh, can lead only to problems. Now, in many cases that you've had to deal with, the facts are obvious, common sense suffices. Once in a while, something comes before you where the facts are not obvious, they're esoteric, they're scientific. Uh, the last one I can remember was the infamous press project where the science facts had to do with the behavior of radio waves uh, between and inside buildings. Uh, either of those facts were not adequately appreciated or they were ignored because press, as it was rolled out, of course, was a big problem. Uh, lives were put at risk, the police especially, and it did not do the reputation of the CRD any good. Fast forward now, here we are in 2012, and yet again we have a second highly science-based project. In this case, the science is about the nature of our oceans and the creatures that inhabit them and what happens when they deal with uh, waste. Now, I'm not an ocean scientist. I don't believe any of you are either. However, I am the retired dean of the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Victoria and a former director of NSERT, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council. In both those capacities, I had the opportunity to review the work of the ocean scientists at UVic. I'm just here to tell you that these people are a world-class group. They're one of the better ocean science organizations in the world. In my opinion, the best in Canada. We're fortunate to have them. Uh, so the moral is obvious. Please listen to them. Please take their advice very seriously. Do not set it aside without compelling reasons. Uh, that's the end of my story. Thank you very much. to present to the board. I'm a resident in Canberra Bay and I'm representing myself. I'm before you this morning in support of Director Dermans and Director Desjardins' motion to suspend further action on the current sewage treatment project titled The Path Forward. The plan is flawed. There has not been any meaningful consultation regardless of what the reports to the Minister of the Environment indicate. Over the past five years, I have brought many concerns about the current plan before this board as a resident, as a director of the Cadre Bay Residents Association, and as the chair for the Friends of Harrow Woods, that this process is flawed. This is supported by the CRD's 2008 core area and West Shore sewage treatment project schedule, <coughs> where it shows that the schedule shows where public consultation is in the last phase of the path forward. And this is the document I'm referring to. It comes after citing and every other discussion. The consultation process in the path forward is at the end of the process, not the beginning. The flawed process was also highlighted in a letter from the Gordon Head Residents Association stating the following. We have written to the CRD expressing our concern about the lack of full public consultation on the process. They note that the tight timelines for public input set by the CRD and that the consultation process has been inadequate and has taken place at a time when many residents were away on holidays. What you are about to embark upon will not only have a negative impact on the environment, but profoundly affect our future and our children's children. Your peers have reviewed the current plan and agree the path forward has the potential to have a negative impact on both. 
Who will be responsible and who will foot the bills for any related environmental disasters, degradation or loss? Such an uncomfortable truth makes the costly and laborious exercise of pretending that there was genuine consultation process, when in reality it has been a massive waste of our taxpayer dollars. The 2006 CTAP review states that it is doubtful that there will be any long-term economic benefits, and as it stands now, it is also hard to see how your current plan can possibly be good for the land or the sea. The current plan subjects our seniors and young families to financial hardship. So I would caution you to take due diligence to consider all the factors when it comes to the health and well-being of the citizens. <coughs> to date, millions of taxpayers' hard-earned dollars have been spent on telling us what a good job is being done on our behalf. The CRD ads boasted, four system configurations considered, 114 sites investigated, 54 public engagement sessions, 15 major studies on resource recovery, and yet we are none the wiser and the path forward moves ahead in its flawed manner. I am suggesting that meaningful public consultation is still needed prior to any further studies and reports to the Minister of the Environment claiming public consultation was part of the process, when in reality, meaningful consultation never took place. It would seem appropriate to quote Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. It takes less time to do a thing right than it does to explain why you did it wrong. In closing, once again, I remind the committee of your obligation to the taxpayers. We can and must do a better job than what you have before you. Thank you for this time. Thank you. Um, I, at this time, I'd like to take a short two-minute break and then come back. Uh, can we give us a little bit of a caucus around here because I've got a number of people telling me that, that they have other meetings that they've committed to, including myself. Um, the one thing I would like to do, though, is proceed with um, Mr. Yeah. Rob Stamp because we're paying him, the consultant, uh, because we're paying him to be here. And then adjourn uh, this meeting and continue this meeting yeah. either on November the 21st or the 28th, and the committee members will have to be handled. <coughs> I know that around this table will be in some people more than once. <laughs> And um, we'll have a lot to say. So I don't want to um, compress the time that we have to debate the topic today. But I would like to uh, allow the consultant, Rob Singh, to speak to address us because he's brought in specifically. And then uh, someone will canvas uh, to see whether the 21st or the 28th is the best time to reconvene the family. Uh, how, how many uh, directors are able to stay? Oh, okay, fair enough. I just thought, well, we have the public here. I thought it would be worthwhile to continue. Well, the public will be invited for okay, thank you. They're all open meetings. So. I mean, we were supposed to be down in 15 minutes. Okay, so. okay the next item is. Oh, sorry, I'm very good. I didn't see you. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't disagree with uh, the need to debate these motions. But November 21st, I'm away. Okay, and then I'll put it there. I will ask that to canvas the committee and hopefully get as many people who are sitting well, here. Well, as I have the motion on the floor, I would uh, hope that uh, although uh, for whatever reason the majority can attend on the 21st, that I can be present when my motion goes forward. We'll take the Thank you. Thank you. Uh, waste Water Technologies, Rob Sim. Do you want to introduce this? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Robert Sim, uh, Lee Stantex Water Sector of Practices Processing Engineering Group. Um, he is an active in ongoing research and development in wastewater engineering field, and he is currently on the faculty at the University of British Columbia as an adjunct professor in the Civil Engineering Department. 
So he comes with uh, over 25 years' experience in the municipal industrial wastewater treatment sector. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jack, and everybody. Uh, I'm not here to debate whether or not to do the sewage treatment plant. I was asked to come here to talk specifically about wastewater treatment technology. And I'm going to take 15 minutes, and I don't know how formal or informal we want to be for questions, but we'll, I'll try my best to make it 10. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about wastewater treatment, past, present, and future. Uh, what I see is the future directions in wastewater treatment, uh, some of the contaminants of emerging concern, uh, and then some of the emerging uh, technologies uh, that I've been involved in and continue to be involved in, and specifically some of them that uh, I understand that there's interest around the table, and then some of the things to consider when you impl implement some of these new wastewater technologies. So wastewater treatment itself, the primary focus uh, initially was, was public health protection, and what I've seen over the last uh, 25 years is really a shift from uh, wastewater treatment plant to water pollution control center, water reclamation facility, uh, looking at reclaiming water, and now uh, you'll see a very big push uh, in the research literature and, and really in practice to a resource recovery center. So what does the future hold? Um, if you look right across North America and around the world, uh, we're seeing a, a much bigger push uh, for continued and more stringent uh, ethical criteria, uh, specifically as they relate to compound, compounds of emerging uh, concern, maximization of resource recovery. There's a, 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 a growing realization that we global uh, resources are dwindling. Um, and then one of the other things that, that is particularly exciting is that there's a lot of uh, input or a lot of work being done in molecular biology, genetics, uh, to help us optimize the treatment processes that we already have. And this is just an example of, of areas where you can get uh, some of the resources recovered from wastewater. Uh, some of these things I understand that you're currently proposing to do. And then I'm going to talk specifically about a couple of these. Uh, one is microbial fuel cells, which I understand there's an interest here. Um, uh, algae uh, production, which there, I haven't heard mentioned here, but is something that uh, I have an interest in. Um, and then molecular biology. So contaminants of emerging concern, I've heard a little bit of discussion about that in some of the, the presentations that were done this morning. And, and really, we're continuing to find new uh, contaminants of emerging concern. Uh, there's a lot of talk, or I heard a lot of talk this morning about BOD and total suspended solids. There's a lot of contaminants in, in household goods, like toothpaste, and deodorants, um, uh, that some of these treatment processes are removed over and above uh, the BOD and TSS that these regulations are based upon. Uh, and really what we're seeing is more and more of a push to higher levels of treatment and add on or bolt on what I call bolt on treatment processes after uh, secondary treatment. And this is an example of a project that we're working on in Reno Stead in Nevada. Uh, we have, they have existing secondary treatment uh, and they're looking to remove some of these contaminants from emerging concern. We're at the pilot stage now. And, and really what we're looking at is membrane filtration, ozonation, and biologically active carbon. And we're removing a lot of these uh, contaminants from emerging concern. You can add these uh, processes at the end of, uh, of the secondary treatment. Uh, there's some places like Southern California where you've gone as far as advanced oxidation and then reverse osmosis and then and removing virtually everything in the water and then injecting uh, that treated effluent back into the aquifer and then it's used uh, as, as drinking, indirectly as drinking water. So those technologies are there. So some of the emerging technologies uh, that I understand that you're interested in, I'll start with microbial fuel cells and then I'll talk about engineered algae and then molecular biology. Basically, um, when, we, when we talk about uh, microbial fuel cells, we're taking advantage, you hear about biochemical oxygen demand, um, the, the reactions that are undertaken by bacteria to, to basically break down wastewater 
are both biological and, and biochemical. Uh, what we do uh, with the microbial fuel cell is when we take organic matter and we separate to an anaerobic cathode, we have bacteria under anaerobic conditions. They're able to take the organic matter, extract the electrons from that organic matter when they're breaking it down, and then those electrons flow in, in a wire and you can produce electricity. Uh, it's an exciting technology. It's one that I've been involved in uh, helping uh, with uh, a company commercialize the technology. And there's some, certainly some interesting uh, potential. Uh, this is, uh, depending on whose reports you look at, uh, the potential is maybe 15.5 watts per cubic meter of wastewater treatment treated. Uh, so to give you an example, uh, if you had a plant serving 100,000 people, you could potentially generate enough power to uh, serve approximately 500 homes. Okay? Uh, the potential for CRD would be approximately 1.7 megawatts or 1,000 homes and understand you have roughly 100,000. It's relatively new technology and it requires further development. Uh, so my experience, um, I think they're a great idea. They're at the research stage. Uh, right now I'm working with a company by the name of Pilus Energy. Uh, they've got a very exciting technology for, that was developed at the University of Cincinnati. Um, I think that we're probably 10 years out of commercialization. One of the issues with a lot of these technologies is finding the funds to do the commercialization. A lot of people think these are great ideas and, and I'm actually uh, working with these folks. We're having some difficulty finding, surprisingly, uh, venture capital. Everybody wants the pilot, nobody wants to pay for it. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, the president of Pilus is a very, very uh, um, optimistic and, and uh, uh, visionary person, but there's some, some problems with, with getting the money to, to develop some of this technology. And the, the Pilus technology is particularly exciting um, because they're using genetically modified organisms to basically increase uh, the amount of energy or, or power that can be produced. And, 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 and several fold higher than what, what, what is uh, typically thought of some of these organisms. But one of the issues uh, is when you start using genetically modified organisms is what if they get into the environment? And so there's pros and cons to a lot of this stuff. Um, some, of the, some of the research uh, that's, that's going on right now, or I call bug, bugs being worked out, uh, no pun intended, is microbial fuel cells. Uh, there's low power density. There's a restricted output voltage. Uh, a lot of this stuff can be overcome, but it takes time and research to do that. And a lot of the research is, is, is focused on the development of better analog and cathode materials, uh, better uh, designs, and understanding electron transfer mechanism. Um, it's a fairly complex process, but again, we're at the research stage, and, there's, and we're at the pilot stage. Uh, and I use the pilots as an example. We're in the process of trying to find uh, or, uh, organizations that would be interested in, in piloting these types of technology. And then these are just some quotes. Uh, Penn State is, a, is one of the leaders in, in uh, microbial fuel cell technology. Again, the, the message being here is a fantastic idea. I think the future has a lot to hold for microbial fuel cells, but potentially depending on the quality of the research uh, and, and funding, uh, you know, in my personal opinion, you're probably 10 years out before you see widespread commercial application. A another, another exciting technology that I've, I've been uh, work, working with, uh, um, and this is a very, another good, uh, good idea, is, is engineered algae, and looking at genetically uh, engineered algae, Potentially, uh, this is again a fantastic idea, uh, and this isn't my idea. That's why I'm saying it. it's it's an idea of uh, a couple of entrepreneurs is is using uh, wastewater as a feedstock uh, to produce um, algae that can then be dried that you can make biofuels out of. Uh, and one of the interesting things, food additives, and then uh, nutraceuticals. And what those are is feedstocks for pharmaceuticals. Very very exciting stuff. But again, this is the, and plastics. So there's a lot of good things and good research going on, but again, it depends on the quality of the research and everything else, and again, something that's probably in, in the 10 year uh, range in terms of commercialization. And then really, uh, one of the most exciting things, and it doesn't get spoken about
about a lot because it doesn't involve a process, it's molecular biology. And, and, and a lot of people get surprised when you tell them this, is that our ability through, through genetics to be able to identify the microorganisms that are actually doing the treatment uh, it is extremely important. Uh, historically, we've been able to identify those organisms by culturing them. Uh, culture to, and then when you get a culture organisms, you better know what food to give them. With genetic techniques, we can, we can identify organisms we weren't able to culture before, and we're actually developing new processes as a result of helping optimize processes uh, that we currently have. This is a this is a this is a picture of a of a, some bacterial colonies taken from a wastewater plant with a standard kind of focal microscope. Um, uh, people look at that and they probably uh, say, "What the heck is that?" It means something to me. I took the picture myself. Uh, it's exciting stuff, but uh, you know, and, and really by looking at, at that structure, uh, we're able to, to get a better idea of how wastewater treatment works. And by getting a better idea of how wastewater treatment works, we're able to optimize plants and bring costs down. And some of this technology is now coming into the, into the fray in terms of wastewater treatment. I'm trying to keep to your 10 minutes, and hopefully reasonably close. I, so, so when will the future get here? Um, well, there's a number of things that we have to keep in mind. The wastewater industry really moves slowly, and uh, on new technologies, uh, there's a number of reasons for that. One is what's the profit motive? Okay, there was a person coming up here the one that spoke earlier about having wastewater facilities in, in, in public hands, and there's a flip side to that. Um, that's, that's one reason. The other is anybody that's following the, current, the aftermath of, of Superstorm Sandy can see that, that reliability of infrastructure is important. So what tends to happen is that a lot of municipal utilities, and, and private utilities as well, tend to be very conservative in what they use, and, and they want to make sure that what the technologies they're using are, are tried and tested. Um, there's a lot of great technologies out there, um, but you know it takes time to commercialize them, and the, and the time it takes depends upon the quality of the research and availability of funding. Uh, in a lot of cases, no venture capital is no means no commercialization and no full scale application, uh, and the technology development cycle is typically in the 10 plus year range. In many cases, it's even longer, and it depends upon having somebody behind that decides they're going to fund that. And, and when, if, if you've ever gone for venture capital, uh, they want results tomorrow. And a lot of this thing doesn't, stuff doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Uh, somebody that does research, it's disappointing, but uh, those are just some of the facts. So hopefully I've, it's up to your 10 minutes. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Will these slides and the presentation be available to us over our web, Madam Chair? Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just how scalable are microbial fuel cells expected to be? Uh, you know, it's it's it's. Uh, if you look at the stuff that we're doing with Pilus, it's it's modular. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and 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 it will be fully scalable. Uh, again, the issue that we have is 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 finding places to pilot it, and once you pilot it, you find other things. And sure. And, and uh, just one other question. I presume you're well aware of the. Uh, group in Oregon this year who indicated they had an increase in energy density of anywhere from 10 to 50 times within their cell. Yeah. It's a fairly exciting prospect. All exciting stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, two questions. The first one um, is the are the fuel cells at the front end or the back end of the system? So, so basically, all of these biological processes work on the soluble portion of the wastewater. So you're still going to have uh, grit removal, okay, and organics out, because they don't have that. And, and you're still going to have the, the process to remove, for you know, lack of better terms, it won't sound gross, but the lumps. You're going to remove the primary sludge out. And, and a lot of people ask, why would you want to do that? That primary material really has energy value. Um, and then, so it would be very similar process, process to a secondary pro a treatment process, preliminary treatment primary treatment, your biological treatment, in this case, would be microbial fuel cell, and then some sort of cleanup process, potentially at the end, to clean up any strike or solids. So how adaptable could um, current technology be to introduce microbial fuel cells or other uh, pro 
processes at a labor stage? Um, you know, could it require a new plant, or could the existing sort of hard infrastructure be tools? So, so the front end processes would be the same, okay? And my experience has been that, that uh, engineers tend to find clever ways to reuse uh, the existing processes. Concrete tends to add to uh, survive for 50 plus, 75. I've seen some plants 80 years. Uh, you get life of, of concrete. Uh, MBR technology is a prime example where people have gone in and retrofitted tanks, um, existing tanks, to, to retrofit the process. So I guess it would be maybe wise for the region to look to build tanks that could be adaptable, rather than... So to see what the current technology would be that could be re retrofitted you, later. You, you try to do that. One of, there, there's a couple of issues. Um, first of all, um, it's, it's hard to... It's, you know, as best we try, it's hard to have crystal ball. So we try to keep things as flexible as possible, typically. Um, and, and, and secondly, uh, sometimes you can't always, you can't always do that. My last question, uh, what, what's the state of technology around dealing with heavy metals and uh, byproducts of pharmaceuticals and sort of the, the most toxic component of the waste stream? So, so heavy, heavy metals, um, you know, if you, look at, if you look at where we've come on heavy metals. Um, really the best way to deal with heavy metals is at the source. I, I don't think there's any, but too many people that argue with, with you on that. But what we found, and, if, and there's not one, a number of research uh, topic, uh, articles on this, and, is, and I've seen some of the, some of the data in our own, plant, our own plants, plants I've worked on, is that um, the bacteria, the biomass and the biological process tends to have a net negative charge and you tend to remove or trap a lot of these heavy metals and they tend to end up in the solids uh, portion. Um, contaminants emerging concern is a little bit different. Uh, people talk about them like there's a couple, there's thousands, tens of thousands. And depending upon the type of contaminant, depends on where it ends up. Um, uh, we're finding, we're still doing research on it. There's a really good research uh, report done by uh, Hydromantis uh, for the CCME uh, on, on by a lot on the uh, digestion processes. They show some of the digestion processes remove or, or, or degrade chaos emerging concern and sludge. Uh, and then there's a really good report done by the EU, it's a bit dated now, called the Poseidon Report, where they look at the different types of chaos emerging concern, ibuprofen and, and uh, Viagra residuals and all these other things. And you actually get a fair amount of treatment uh, in, in the actual secondary process. Uh, not all of it, but, but, but some of it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.